I, I think the environmentally, that's the big challenge. That is the, the big monster challenge that we can grow, that they have with as few uh, fertilizers or enhancements as, as uh, possible. And just really- This is Evolve CPG, a community of purpose-driven brand leaders who not only believe in better, but actively pursue it. That's better products, better brands, and better leadership for a better world. I'm your host, Gage Mitchell, founder and creative director of Modern Species, a sustainable brand design agency helping better brands grow and scale their impact. On today's episode, we're speaking with John Porterfield, founder of Woolen Hemp, about organic agriculture and the many uses of hemp. Hi, I'm John Porterfield with the Hemp Holding Company here in Montana and Woolen Hemp. I'm also a part of the Organic Marketing Association as the vice president and uh, work with the organic farmers here across Montana with, through the Montana Organic Association. And uh, just to deeply into the hemp industry and helping it grow and get some realistic expectations for our farmers out there. And uh, it's been an exciting ride. I'm also part of a mineral company here uh, called Ignambrite in Montana. So um, been a part of this whole organic scene for quite a long time now and in support of the organic farmers and helping to grow the market share really has been the biggest challenge, you know, is, is getting off the mark and, uh, and, and really starting to see a bigger influx of people moving to organics and farmers switching to organics. Nice. That's awesome. I'm excited to have you on the show, John. Thanks for joining me. And one thing I know about you, and it was very clear in your introduction there, <laughs> is that you're a man of many roles, um, just like myself. So, um, I'm curious to hear about all of them, but before we dive into some of the more recent roles, when I was poking around on your LinkedIn, I noticed you had some um, earlier career paths into in the hospitality industry, working at some mountains like Elk Mountain and Big Mountain. So I'm curious to hear more about what those roles were. Uh, you know, Elk Mountain Safari was uh, quite a group of people. It was uh, 20 ranchers in Wyoming, and we uh, brought them together in a co-management of the land so that we could patrol during hunting season. And then also so that we could run our dudes out and uh, go out and hunt on the private land and just do it through one company. So it worked out great. We had about 15 lakes and hundreds of miles of streams that we could take clients out on. And, uh, and then a couple of rivers that came through the property too. And so, um, yeah, I could go by snowmobile in the wintertime and go all day to go across the property. It was a 1.25 million acres of land. So oh, it was, included three mountains and you know, we had a lot of exploring. Uh, and that was really good. That was a part of recreation and I was studying recreation management at the time. So it was fun. We were doing river trips on a daily basis and uh, and just outfitting, you know, taking people, outfitting them for uh, fun fun trips in the, in the mountains of Wyoming on the North Platte River. And uh, sometimes on whitewater trips, sometimes flat water. Um, it was spectacular. Sometimes we'd take jet boats and we'd be fishing tailwater fisheries on uh, dams. And other times we'd be just, you know, open wilderness floating. So, and camping and doing a, the whole thing. It didn't matter. We just, whatever the customer wanted to do, we always just came through for it. Wow. Yeah. That sounds like a pretty fun, adventurous job to have, like kind of a dream job for many people. <laughs> yeah. And that transitioned further. Yeah. That transitioned it more into, uh, recreation from the side of working in the ski industry here in Montana mm -hmm. and uh, being able to uh, complete my internship up at uh, in Whitefish at the Big Mountain Ski and Summer Resort. It's known as Whitefish Mountain Resort now, but uh, back in those early days, you know, just helping to really build the Canadian market. And they just pushed me up into Canada and said, go figure it out, you know? And so uh, really had a lot of fun with the Canadians. It was a big part of my life. And uh, I just love um, the ski groups and all that whole scene and, and the ski industry. In general, it's been really, really good. Nice. Were you like a ski instructor with them or a guide of some sort? What was it? No, I was a sales manager. Uh, sale, I was director of sales. Yep. So it was like basically going out and coordinating with uh, large international tour operators, um, you know, obviously from Canada, but uh, from Europe too. And so we could bring in groups of people and then we do a spring, spring promotion for the following winter and then the fall promotion leading right into the ski season, kind of try to fill out all the rooms that we'd have. And that was just basically the plan, just do that all over. And then I worked in the golf industry too. Huh. I uh, represented all the, the 10 golf courses here in the Flathead Valley. And uh, that was really exciting. We got to go around to about 30 different cities across North America and go to golf shows, just promote the destination as a 
as a finished destination, you could come out and play, you know, six or eight courses in a week and people would have a lot of fun. Nice. With. Okay. So there's a lot of sales and obviously outdoor healthy lifestyle activities in, in all of those experiences. Yeah, it's a, it's great fun. I mean, the mountains of the West were important to me too. I, I grew up in the Midwest and I was allergic to corn pollen and not a good place to be if you're going to have a allergic reaction to corn pollen. So right in the corn belt, uh, moving to Montana and Wyoming areas were just a, a game changer in terms of being able to breathe in the summertime. And, uh, and so that was huge too. But, uh, but ultimately the West is very captivating. I love the mountains and I love the, I love the farm country of Montana too. It's really, really neat out in the prairies and, uh, and in the mountains, but just an incredible diversity here. Nice. Yeah. So how did that transition from working in those industries? Um, where did you get inspired to shift into the agricultural industry and start Montana Grow? You know, I worked on a project uh, that was trying to find uses for uh, secondary uses for byproducts in industries. And one of them was in the mining industry. And I'd grown up in the mining industry. My dad was in the deep into the coal industry and a variety of other minerals, too, that he was involved with, from molybdenum to silver and copper and uh, and so having that, some of that background uh, kind of led to an opportunity to work with a mineral company here in Montana. And then I got contacted by another company and they invited us to come down and kind of the rest is history. We uh, uh, founded a mine uh, with a friend of mine, Robbie Lindsay, and we, a local guy from uh, Billings, Montana. And the two of us came together to kind of rekindle this mine that had been operating, you know, for years. And it was back before the DEQ even was in existence, but then we worked with them and uh, transitioned now into a great management team and a, and a really interesting product that has a lot of multitude of uses in uh, agriculture and, and in uh, different parts of animal science. And uh, so that was an important transition for me is to see the opportunity to work and kind of do, do more really to try to, have, I had children, you know, having a couple of kids changes your perspective on the world and what your role is and after about 15 years in tourism, uh, construction trades and alternative building materials really kind of took over for me. And, and so hemp was really right on the list, but we just couldn't grow it. You know, we were using straw, wheat straw and, and uh, a variety of other things we were using uh, to, to lighten the load of concrete products, both environmentally and also physically for moving the blocks around. So and finding ways to basically help the mining industry actually exist in the United States so that we could meet environmental standards, but we could, we wouldn't have to be importing the minerals basically. And we wouldn't have to also export the minerals mm. to have them processed further. So we could actually you know, add more value to the things that we've already got. And we definitely have to have the minerals. Montana has this unique, uh, unique challenge, but also the unique uh, uniqueness of having those minerals. And so that was a huge factor for me is that like we have to find some answers here. We're shutting down our mining industry and yet we're the major supplier of a whole long list of incredible minerals, some of the finest minerals in the world, but we couldn't hardly even keep them open. The environmental groups had their foot on the throat of the, of the mining industry and I had a better answer. Basically, we use the waste. We don't treat their waste as waste. We treat it as another part of the buffalo was the experience So basically teaching the mining industry what green mining was all about and really agriculture, teaching agriculture what, what uh, green mining because the, uh, the farmers are mining the soil and, uh, and we all can learn from what green mining means. And, uh, and so that immediately got picked up by the concrete producer and put me on the cover of the concrete producer and flew me off to Vegas for a trade show back in 2009. <laughs> you know? nice. And so I've been studying this for quite a long time about using alternative building materials and uh, and integrating those into greater, better systems. And uh, and so that's part of it. Did a lot of work at the World Center for Concrete Technology back in Alpena, Michigan. So, you know, preeminent place to do concrete technology work there. And uh, 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 Dr. Don McMaster and the, the gang and all those people are just amazing. So new hemp opportunities, new new opportunities to bring organic products into every single thing that we do. We don't want to see pesticide use happen out in our, our farms. And so this is the other part of the environmental challenge of not only mining, but also for agriculture. There's a lot of finger pointing that goes at both about environmental damage. And so if we don't have to use the pesticides, if we don't have to use the heavy fertilizers, 
Uh, can we do that? And, and we've proven, you know, that there's organic systems are the best way. We've started, as my friend Bob Quinn would always say, uh, we started as organic farmers and we're going to finish as organic farmers. <laughs> there's just this lag period in between. But, uh, you know, bringing some of those answers to the farms and bringing the answers to the uh, mining companies, you know, it's been a really big challenge for me and, uh, and important. My father said I'd have overnight success in 13 years, so that's coming up pretty soon. So <laughs> that's how these industries work very, very slowly. You know, and I'm deeply involved in the hemp industry from the textile perspective. You know, we want textiles, our clothing, everything that we get, um, and, and new, new products that are being made that can only be made when you get really good quality fibers like the hemp fibers that can be made into graphene and, and then used in batteries. And so technologies that are just exploding into these industries and so we've really just been pushing, you know, from the organic perspective, like uh, my friend Dennis says, you know, change your food, change your life. I found the same thing when I needed to change my, my outlook, I was changing my food and switching to whole organic fruit was like one of the first things I jumped to. And, uh, and then just promoting the organic trade. We're seeing a pretty good uptick this last year at almost a one more percentage we've, from 5% to 6% in the United, in the U.S. for organic foods um and uh, but still about one percent of our farm gate is organic and so what a huge opportunity and hemp is going to bridge this huge gap the gap was how do we control weeds before we grow the final crop that we really want to grow for our cash and so if we can grow hemp and make cash from the hemp and make it better than alfalfa then on top of that our, we'll, we'll be set up without any weeds the following year which means that a lot more farms can transition and should transition to organic using hemp, tall hemp, fibrous tall hemp that doesn't let any weeds grow on the ground as long as it's planted correctly, you know, getting it in. Uh, it can outcompete weeds completely, it just leaves everything completely void down underneath it. So now we have a really good natural technique to control weeds in a, a non organic farm, even if they don't go through the certification process. They can control it using a rotation of wheat of uh, of hemp, and so uh, these are big game changers using natural fibers. Uh, the the pandemic just threw a big wacky curve at us, saying, you know, where's your food come from? Where's your clothes come from? We couldn't get some of these things right, and then we realized, wow, ninety five percent of all of our hemp is probably coming from China or India. Uh, we can supply this, but it's a it's a of a slow process to rebuild industries and re recapture industries and kind of go back to really really old trades and kind of understand how these old systems did in fact work uh, and what it all comes back to is that organic really is the simplest way We're, we've got to do things simply so that we don't overuse water we don't neglect our water by you know causing problems for it that we protect our bees kind of starts right at the bee level uh, you know, we saw a big group of, in the bee side of this, you've got 4,000 honeybees and 4,000 hives that were used in an organic situation. And then they were also uh, sent to a non-organic farm. On the non-organic farms, the bees come back, fewer bees and poor honey. They go to an organic farm, they come back with more bees and more honey and excellent quality honey. If there's not a better example of why we need to get away from using pesticides, the bees are the answer. This is, this is they're telling us exactly what's going on, and, uh, and we have to look out. For them. That's an, a huge factor in all of these things here, too. Yeah, if you want to know which way to grow, ask the bees. <laughs> They'll tell you what they prefer, and that's what we need to do. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, they would. And there's, you know, we're now already seeing technology. Nice. Um, so between like the more sustainable mining for minerals used in the agriculture industry and um, hemp grown on farms in, in rotation to help um, companies eliminate weeds, it sounds like you've done kind of a lot throughout your career to help uh, farmers do more with less to some degree, or at least um, to find better ways to transition to organic. So um, what, I don't know, tell me some of the stories of, of some of the farmers that you've kind of worked with throughout your time um, in terms of some of the differences you've seen and how they're able to grow food or clothing or anything else? Yeah, I, uh, I mean, on all perspectives, it, the, the clothing side and creating textiles is such a new side of it, but we're just starting to move that direction. 
Uh, we're seeing the hemp being used for the hemp seed, which is really exciting. There's the hemp seed oil, which is really good. Yeah. The seed cake that comes from crushing, you know, the seeds you end up still with a little bit of oil in it, but it's about 30 to 50% protein. It's a really, really good additive for our own bodies and for animals. And soon it's going to be exploding into the animal scene and the cows, which are a big part of our world out here. Um, and those are going to be, you know, game changing things. Uh, and we want all those processes to be organic. We want all that seed to be organic. We want all that seed cake to be organic. That's a high protein. And, and we want the fibers. Ultimately, we want all that to, to come back to it. The farm level is really interesting. There's, there's a willingness to go and it, to a certain degree, they like to go big in Montana. They, they, there's, there's, they, we have average size farm is 2000 acres. So it's just not uncommon for people to put in a couple thousand. A lot of them are 12, 15,000 acres. Some control hundreds of thousands of acres. Wow. So it, when you have just an enormous tracts of land, you know, and multiple families involved and uh, co-ops that exist out here too, that are huge. Um, we have commodities that the finest quality wheat in the world, you know, grown here in Montana. And so it's kind of tying into that same group that likes to grow wheat and they can build in a rotation on dry land. We don't have irrigation. So, I mean, for those that do have irrigation, they're interesting and they can grow more faster and with a better take than the dry land farmers. But the dry land is ultimately, we want hemp to be grown in a dry land situation. So we're adding as little cost as possible because we're trying to bring value to the farm and all the way through the system to make a pair of pants to go from dirt to shirt, as they say, <laughs> or field to fabric, yeah. um, you know, it uh, it takes about 13 different companies, different wow. industries involved. Mm -hmm. And so to save a little margin for everybody along the way and not screw over the farmer, which is basically what's been happening, is that the farmer ends up carrying the industry and we can't have that happen anymore. So as we become more as a sophisticated commodity, uh, you know, hemp is going to find its way into all kinds of different uses. And we're, we're just seeing that right now is that the, the farm level, uh, the farmer is embracing it because they're seeing that the guys that are contracting with them are actually grade A companies. And those grade A companies can then ensure that they're going to get paid for growing the crop. And up to now, we've, we've seen a lot of farms. We had 275 farms that grew 55,000 acres of hemp wow. a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. And I don't know of hardly any of them that got a completed contract, maybe 12 really? out of the 275. So that caused us to drop from 275 down to about 14 farms that only grew on, I think, about 12,000 acres. So a big, huge check in the industry right when things are ramping up. Wow. So, but we did see a nice uptick in organics. So the organic side is important because people said, hey, we want organic hemp seed oil. We want organic seed cake. We want organic fiber even. A lot of people overlook the fiber thinking, oh, shoot, fiber industry won't care. But there's all kinds of contaminants, and those can start right at those problems, you know, where we don't want to introduce pesticides or any of the herbicides or things like that, you know, into our processing. So our processing systems have to be now built and hopefully will all be built in an organic way so that they can be certified organic facilities getting organic feedstock coming to them. And so that's been the strong trend is to build more and more on that side. Some of the farms, one of the farms here uh, has stepped up their educational programs. So they, uh, they're actually involved in student learning. They're involved in apprenticeships and a combination of bringing those apprenticeships together. Then you end up with farm leaders that are driven in organic standards. Uh, and this is up at Delicious Farms at Doug Crabtree's place. Uh, really exciting example of what they do and how they bring it together just in vast amounts of land, you know, that's now in the organic control and under a plan and a strategy that is really best for this whole region of Montana. Um, and they're just a little bit out of the golden triangle where the, the highest value wheat is, but they're right. That's they, they do incredible jobs up there. And then you got on the other end of the state, you have people like Jay Stetson, another organic farmer and, and Stetson is able to finish his cows with hemp. Wow. And so hemp finished beef is our future in a big way. High protein, you know, it's fantastic. Mm -hmm. They can just go out and forage in the field. You can grow it for your own right now, but you can't. It's just coming on pretty soon that we're going to get permission to actually have the seed cake fed to cows, you know, on purpose. 
uh, and they'll be finished, which is really, really good. But the Stetson Farm is you know, a huge organic operation and super important to food production down you know, out of the Billings area. And then you go all across the state in a whole variety of ways. You have animals and, uh, and a lot of farmers growing you know, some of the other bigger commodity crops, but also doing a lot of specialty work too. And in the western part of Montana, you tend to have uh, a lot of the wine and grape operators, and they're all operating in an organic way. Some of them aren't certified, but even though they do operate, uh, you know, yeah. fully organic. Uh, but I, I think there's going to be a huge explosion in Montana for organic uh, apples and grapes and berries and all of those things that feed the the the, uh, the, the rest of the winemaking industry. Really, we're going to just see an incredible growth, just as we've seen for the beer too. You know, the microbreweries. Yeah. And these, uh, these wineries are popping up all over the place and we're expected to grow enormous amounts. And so we have an ideal crop with cool nights or an ideal environment here in Montana with cool nights. So good berry production. And so trying to participate at that level and I'm, I'm doing some farming and grew up around farms too. Back in West Virginia, we had large farming acres that uh, we were always kept really busy as a, a big family. And it was either picking apples or picking strawberries or farming, you know, getting the, the family garden going. Wow. It was fun. Yeah. Man, it sounds like the Montana farming industry is kind of paving the way for organic and in, in, in a bunch of different categories. That's awesome. I think it's trying to. Do you have stats in terms of like the different states and percentage of uh, organic farms? And is, is Montana kind of growing faster than others in your... I think we're... Um... We're not growing as fast. Like the percentage rates are growing higher in other states, and like Vermont is a, has got a really, really good program. Uh, but I think we're number two. I think California's got a pretty much lock solid. They've got so many farms and a lot of organic interest. And then I think Montana's number two in total acres. Wow. We're somewhere around probably a half a million acres, which makes it difficult for a lot of states to even compete. They're like half a million acres. My gosh, that's organic. <laughs> But these are on huge farms. A lot of them are two to four thousand acres, and so combined, we have about three hundred and fifteen members, I think, in our organic program across Montana, and uh, you know, part of the Montana Organic Association. And so, a great group of people, you know. And it's like one time a year, you know, the whole group comes together, you know, and we couldn't come together last year. So there's kind of this hiccup, but there was also this kind of Zoom experience too, where we met online. We still had board meetings. We still do our thing. Um, nice. and then we do farm tours and things like that. And so the farm tours are a really good way for people to get kind of introduced to organic farming and, uh, and see what's going on. We're having a lot of, uh, we have a program here called the national center for appropriate technologies that runs the ATRA program for farms and helps, uh, basically troops. Cause we're expecting to get about 3000, maybe 3,500 troops coming home from Afghanistan and, uh, the, the middle East. And so those guys and gals, uh, there's programs to help them transition into farming, and we want them all to transition oh, nice. into organic farming. And uh, yeah. it's like ground forces, they can get involved in the, the ground ops, this program that they get involved just from video standpoints. So they come back and they learn how to uh, apply skills uh, that for flying drones and things like that that they can apply to agriculture. And, uh, and some really cool programs. Cornell has a great program we're trying to mimic here in Montana. And... Uh, and, and really helping farmers to pick up the skills for organic farming, but also to help these uh, these troops transition back in through this these ATRA grants. So ATTRA, ATRA is a great program, and it really uh, just lays the whole basis of really just showing them to go from no experience to full production. Nice. And uh, and so everybody can benefit from it, but uh, in particular the troops are going to highly benefit over this coming year. Yeah, I love that idea. Like, uh, you know, people need jobs, especially veterans. And then also the farming world needs more farmers, right? As the industry ages out. So <laughs> we do. The prairies are getting empty and we have 10% of our population. The whole 10% of our population are veterans. So you can imagine 10% wow. of Montana's population has been better than 100,000 veterans that live here. And it's an enormous need for services that we just don't seem to always have. And uh, we're trying to make up for it, really. But uh, a lot of people want to get away, obviously, 
And I think COVID sent that same message out, you know, because we can tell by our real estate prices, you know, people were flooding <laughs> the state. But for, for yeah. troops, they've been choosing Montana for a long time to come and just bring it down a notch and learn skills like farming and things like that that have given them that husbandry to the land that is really cool. Great. And a number of them are, are organic farmers, too, in our organization. So it's great to see. And it's great to see, too, some of the organic farmers. We have stories of you know, now being able to grow hemp, you know, and the hemp products, uh, hemp and the medicines from the hemp plant have helped to save uh, one of the son's lives, you know, one of our organic farmers. And so wow. enormously mm -hmm. important, you know, that uh, we provide this huge role that our food banks went empty for a period of time last March and April. And really? all the organic mm -hmm. farms came together to take bins that we normally have, you know, that are going out by the train load. And suddenly those were going into super sacks and going to food bank facilities. Nice. So we were able to supply organic grains from across Montana directly into our food bank system. So for the first time ever. So really at the, that the, those with the highest need were getting the highest nutritional value products from Montana. It was a great savior for kind of bringing together excess grain that wasn't going to get exported and getting that into a, a smaller bags that could be distributed to homes. Nice. How was that organized? Was that through Montana? Organic Association. Oh, our executive director at uh, organic, the Montana Organic Association, Jamie Lockwood and uh, Becky Weed, our current president, they just kind of drove it together. And Montana's uh, food bank network had the need. It was kind of like they got the need. The farms have it. We could get the farms paid a reasonable amount, so the farms were still getting paid. It wasn't just a straight donation. Yeah. And so it was. It brought things together that we had never done before. And so to to Jamie and Becky and a few of the others that brought that together. That's, it just took a lot of hard work. And in a matter of about two weeks, we had product flowing from, you know, from big bins to super sacks and going directly into the food bank. So they found a way to just kind of just cut through the chase and get organic products right in the hands into smaller bags too. So for the first time, the food banks were getting, you know, Montana grown uh, grains and lentils and, it was it was really great yeah that makes me think of the the phrase or quote or or adage whatever you would call it uh that necessity is the mother of invention i just love how creative and fast acting and innovative people can get as soon as it all of a sudden goes from a we should do this to we must do this we need to do it right now and p people pull together and do amazing things yeah it's uh, because there's the, the inventories were so strong you know, there were, there were excess bins that weren't contracted. And so at that point, you kind of got to make a choice. And it's like, hey, I can still get paid and actually benefit people right here. Most of our grains are shipped over to Italy and, you know, the, just high value kamut and things like that that are just extraordinarily high valued in the world. Um, yeah, suddenly kamut is flowing into our food banks and uh, things like that that nice. we just had not seen. And so I, we bridged that gap. I don't know how much we grew in terms of our percent of growth, but it was probably at least one or two percent of total overall growth for Montana. Uh, and in certain segments, you know, it was probably, you know, 10 or 15 percent. So yes. it's exciting to see. I think there's going to be more farmers transitioning now uh, because weeds were always the problem. How do they set up the barley crop that they want to sell to Miller or uh, Coors and, uh, or Budweiser? And that was the issue. And so they'd spray Roundup or they'd kill it's terrible, and we've, and we've got to get away from having those uh, negative impacts on our soil, in our land, our water systems, our wildlife, all those things. So organic is the answer. I mean, good food comes from great organic food, and uh, that's a great celebration. You know, when I, when I first met Dennis, you know, we were at Organicology, and uh, it's in Portland, you know, and they get together a few years, and it's the whole world of organics is there. I mean, it is an incredible show. Uh, and you eat all this incredible organic food, and you learn the entire story, chain of custody on everything you're eating from the salad to the dessert. It's a crazy story. But uh, most of it was amazingly positive. But Dennis and I found that some of the messages were super negative and really like hitting people in the face like, oh, no, this isn't what we want to do. Yeah. And so we, we were laughing about it, but we really... We, we bonded instantly, you know, over what could be the future of the organics with using a positive message and to try to take this positive kind of, you know, get more bees with honey than vinegar, right? 
and just really try to take that positive side of it because it was really confusing once we used uh, statistics and all this hard analysis of how organic is and what's better. Shoot, nobody really cared in the end. They just wanted to see if it tasted good and if it was good for you and it wasn't laden with uh, chemicals. So uh, we've got a lot of farms that are in the non-organic side. We're going to try to help to convince them to, to make the switch by integrating hemp into their rotation. This is the big answer for them. And I think that that's going to be changing a lot of American agriculture as we shift to American textiles, to American-made goods, to, to new industries that can be made from the hemp plant that are going to affect everything from fuel to aluminum to, uh, you know, you name it. I mean, there's all kinds of things that it's, it's coming into, to battery systems, you know. Um, and I'm excited because, you know, Montana will have a key role. We get to grow the crop once. If you're down in Texas, you might get two or three chances, you know, to grow in a season. But uh, it's critical. I think we grow exceptionally high quality. And, uh, and we have a, a, a good uh, supportive state. The state has gotten behind this. They were the first to switch to making hemp a commodity, which was huge. But they're really uh, proactive in terms of working with the different farming groups. So those farming groups now have the ability to kind of self-tax themselves. Hmm. You know? Interesting. And so that then creates a fund that the state can manage to help promote the entire industry. And we do it with beef and cows and that, that whole scene and our milk and dairy products. And, uh, and we do it with wheat too and barley. And so now with hemp and nice. I'm sure we'll do it with other crops too, but it's, it helps that we have excellent testing facilities. So that ensures that the buyer, you know, when they're buying Montana products, that they're, they're getting what they say. And so that, that was huge. Um, and that protects the farmer too. And so the farm can then know exactly what they're trying to bring into the marketplace. They know their variances in seasons uh, as to how every crop comes off and same with hemp too. So we're, uh, we're seeing an uptick, you know, for sure. I think this next year is gonna be an exciting year of growth, both in the hemp industry and across organics. Yeah. Um, should be nationwide really, because what we've seen now, again, what I was talking about before is where the heck is our food coming from? And our clothing and everything we get and it's got a whole bunch of made in china labels on it and uh it, it just the line's been drawn in the sand it's that's that's just cutting out that supply line it's like saying nope and a lot of times we're seeing products still brought into the organic trades that are grown organically or brought into in through through some connection and they're still they're foreign sources brought in and then they're still put on but they're actually manufactured here and so there's we got to go even deeper into the chain of custody. That's what we're, I think that's what the blockchain technology is going to allow for. That's what other new tagging technologies are going to allow for is to just absolutely prove to the consumer um, that, and to the buyer that's going to buy the raw goods to make something from it. They don't want to be buying from a source that's really not a, a trackable, traceable source. And, and, and the environment, the environment's been screaming at us, you know, for many years about causing degradation into our waterways. And so, finding ways to switch more to organic, you know, it's just critical to our future. And the, the little bit of water that we do have, you know, that we have to utilize it best. And, uh, and so those are things that organic is going to continue to lead the way for a long time. Nice. Yeah. I, I didn't realize that hemp was used for weed control like that. That's amazing. But um, I, I also know that uh, speaking of hemp and American made that you've uh, somewhat recently launched a new business called Woolen Hemp. Can you talk a little bit about how that came to be? That uh, it really was looking at the the natural products industry that uh, a number of customers that we had uh, were looking for ways to grow a natural fiber and not use a poly. And so in their poly products, they had very limited uh, places that they could use the poly products if they went into uh, utilization in uh, sensitive areas that they needed something that was natural. And so hemp, wool, cotton, you know, those were, those were some, and for me, it was all about hemp. If I could replace this and if I could bring wool into the mix, wool actually would take an uptick. So the natural fiber of wool has been on a downward spiral in American hmm. textiles for at least 20 plus years. Uh, and so this, we have a lot of sheep in Montana, quarter of a million sheep and uh, a lot of great wool growers that I, I'm just here to support in any way, shape or form and the hemp growers. So a lot of hemp growers that, didn't have contracts fulfilled. They have tons of product available. And so I'm trying to bring those two things together. And that's really what 
what that uh, opportunity is. And there, there'll be a lot of really neat things that will come from that. Flax is another one that we grow here in Montana. The flax fiber is very similar to the hemp fiber. And uh, as we can prove out that we have the ability to, to supply these natural fibers to mills in the United States, uh, they'll be able to switch and they'll be able to find pieces of their production cycle that they'll be utilizing American grown, proven that it's American grown. And, and it's gonna be, that's, that's the important part for everybody. Anyone that wants to make finished products, they need to know the story back about how it got to them mm -hmm. from the field mm -hmm. you know, to the fabric. And uh, it's a really exciting story, really. I mean, it's, it's a, but it's super involved. And I think it proves out that, especially with a new commodity like hemp is, that we have to know that there's a lot of different touches along the way, a lot of different processes that are involved. It's environmentally, it's way far superior to cotton, um, but it's these natural fibers that are good, much better for the earth and better for our more sustainable farming practices. And, uh, and you can't go around to any farm or ranch around Montana or anywhere that doesn't have the, the poly rope, that poly, the plastic poly rope that's been around for a long time now, and it should go away. We should be back to natural ropes and natural netting that we use for bailing. And uh, that'll be a really good site. That's something that I'm really yeah. pressed to, to see. Nice. So, yeah, can you, do you know, like one of the things that um, I, I want to say it was like 10 years ago or something for the textile industry, people started using bamboo a lot as this quote unquote sustainable alternative, which, you know, it's nice that it's renewable and so on and so forth grows fast. But from what I've red slash herd it takes just so many chemicals and such harsh processing to turn it into something soft like a fabric for a shirt or a pillowcase or something like that but but hemp right in my understanding is much easier to convert <laughs> to textiles but can you talk a little bit about that I, I think the environmentally that's the big challenge that is the the big monster challenge that we can grow the hemp with as few of uh, fertilizers or enhancements as, as uh, possible and just really minimize that. We can grow it in dry land conditions. We don't have to grow it in irrigated. Um, for Texas and places like that, they, they'll have to have irrigation if they're going to try to get like a second crop in. But in most cases, we can usually get one crop to trigger just naturally coming out of winter. Um, and that should be enough that, that that will give us enough production for a lot of new facilities and new opportunities to bring all the bit different pieces and parts of the plant, primarily the seed and the high protein seed cake, and then the fibers and the herd. The herd's the inside woody portion of it, and it, it has a great feature in all kinds of different products. And we're seeing industries start to convert to that because if you can replace something that's heavier, let's say it's a concrete product, it's a block, and the block goes from 30 pounds to 20 pounds because you've replaced some of the aggregate in the block, then that becomes favorable, it can be shipped further, it uh, might have better integrity based on how you're building with it so that it could actually not have as much breakage. So that's just one example in one building trade in one portion, just the block industry and block technology. Shoot, they, the block machinery, they, they can make 4,500 different shapes of blocks, you know, just out of one machine. So you want a different shape, you can add more hemp into it. We can do all kinds of replacements that are just like that. So I've been doing a lot of that research for the years and and uh, it's exciting to see that it's going to finally, we're, we're there since the 2018 Farm Bill. Yeah, so beyond your uh, woolen hemp textile company where you're making, um, I think it's like linens, like pillowcases and, and different things like that. But it uh, sounds like maybe you'll be launching another hemp-based company to help with the construction industry. Absolutely. <laughs> in the near future. Yeah. Yeah. And maybe even I was hearing some flex too, so maybe it'll be woolen hemp flex or something like that in the near future. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, why not? I, the flax is really interesting, and it's a wonderful seed oil, too. And so we can press the seed oil, really similarly processed plant. And, um, and, and you know, we have a history of it, too. And we, we grew it. We've been growing both flax and hemp for a lot of years. You know, in Kentucky, it's been like 1700s. But in Montana, about the earliest I can find is like in early 1900s. We had a military base in Montana, and they grew it and did a research study from 1914 to 1919 trying to control Canada thistle hmm. and using it much like I'm explaining to you is that they found that it has to be at least a nine foot tall variety has to be planted with 25 pounds per acre of uh, density 
and then you end up with a dense stand that the weeds can't compete with it and it's at least nine feet tall it's it's tight and uh, shoot you know, there's no thistle involved and so if you can control them naturally like that that is really the best trick and uh, so organic farms are now able to use this too uh, pretty quick we're going to be able to turn our cows loose on it be able to sell that product to other neighbors with cows that'll be a, a huge mm -hmm. change in our whole uh, economics here and I think and even in the quality of the beef that's coming from Montana which is already just incredibly extraordinary yeah as you mentioned before like the maybe grass-fed but hemp finished or flax finished or something like that beef sounds amazing <laughs> I'd be excited to try that it is I've already tasted I, I can I can vouch for it it is yeah, go to if my friend uh, Jay Stetson. I mean, order it up. You can get whole sides of these hemp finished beef. You know, it's uh, stetsonbeef.com. Nice. Yeah, fantastic. Mm -hmm. All organic, grass-fed. It's the best beef on the planet, I think. I, I, Texans would probably take issue with that. <laughs> yeah, they'll take issue with everything, though. So. <laughs> Stetson's involved in Texas. It's, it's, it's good. Nice. But it's awesome. I mean, it's amazing, really, what good food can do to change people's lives and improve um improved so much of what's going on. I think as somebody was joking about is that uh, now that the COVID is kind of passed, we can go back to just dying of other things, heart disease and high blood pressure and things like that. So, and, and so the, it was a bad joke in effect that really we still have to get back to really good food and how that, that food is our medicine. And, uh, and so as we treat our, what we put in, you know, that's what, how we can expect our energy level. So I have high energy. I have high needs to, to, uh, to eat well. And so, yeah, the better I can eat, the better I can feel and the better I can, as my dad always said, if you can't take care of yourself, then how are you going to take care of other people? And if you can't take care of them, what are you doing here? So yeah. kind of, if you've got this obligation to, to eat well and do good and, uh, and to change your food, change your life, you know, by just improving it through organics. Yeah. So speaking of which, you mentioned the organic marketing association and, Dennis, you know, one of the co-founders there too. Um, so what, what do you, what do you hope to achieve through the organic marketing association? I think, you know, one of the biggest things is just to, uh, broaden the appeal of brands that are made from organic feedstock, whether it's berries or whether it's coming from grains, uh, just to help to support the brands. We're in absolute support of every organic brand that's made here in the United States. And that's something that doesn't exist from a brand perspective. And I think from uh, the uniqueness of taking branding and uh, helping with marketing. Yeah. You know, when you help companies with marketing, it's third party advertising. It's like, hey, we didn't come up with this as a company. They did, but we're embracing it. And because we can embrace, it's a win-win. Everybody wins because now we've got the entire group all of the products that are in the organic branding behind organic marketing association suddenly have power in each other yeah because it's just yeah. carrying that message forward to more people and i think it carries it in a different attitude with an attitude of of uh happiness of basically that it's fun and eating good makes you feel good and when you feel good you have more fun you know and it's like some of the you know, the, the, the tongue in cheek things that came out, you know, the do organic apples, you know, improve your sex life. We don't know, but it's an easy way to find out. Those, I mean, little, little did anybody know, you know, that when you put that kind of sign at a trade show like Organicology and a four foot by four foot sign, you get a lot of attention. And people start bidding for those signs to somehow fly them home on the aircraft or ship them home. Wow. How are they going to get these home? But Pete, they were prized items. So every one of those was really important. And I would, I was wearing my t-shirts, you know, with stake your life on it with a big, beautiful T-bone steak on there and organic, um, and other funny sayings. So every day I had, people were talking and grabbing and every trade show I go to, I'm wearing my hemp shirts for the most part. And people love the sayings on the, the shirts and the fact that you can get that you're supporting the organic cotton industry in that case, because it's got the t-shirts are cotton, uh, which I'm happy to support that any side of the organic trades, uh, hemp is coming. Hemp's day is coming, you know, and yeah. cotton knows yeah. it. 
Cotton's shaking in its boots. Yeah. But uh, yeah, not, it's okay. We're gonna get, we'll, we'll be like this with cotton for a long time. Our jeans are going to be made with cotton and, and have, you know, a lot of products are going to be blended for a long time um, before we figure out more technology to really soften and get this high graded um, hemp fiber that we can make more like 100% products out of that too. But, uh, and, the, and further do better things for the environment. You know, I think that's where all the industries have really kind of had to take a little self check on the environment. They have to take a little self check on their own supply chains. And so we have this great ability, I think, to, to grow these industries. The Organic Marketing Association is this critical tool to, to launch new marketing, uh, launch a new brand, you know, to test a new brand um, and to have fun, to really have fun with it. Because when you have fun and you're, it's just contagious, people, you know, when you're at a trade show and everybody's having fun at the Covilli booth because they're ever all wearing pucker up baby, you know, T-shirts <laughs> with big lemons on them. It's amazing how much attention people get and give you when you wear these Organic Marketing Association shirts with little funny sayings on them. It's really good. Some are a little too risque for some crowds, you know, yeah. you know, and so we've kind of had to like tame it down just a little bit to keep it, you know, kind of where we, you know, be friendly out in the prairie, you know, but, uh, yeah. but it's been really fun. I think we've had, uh, we had all the researchers at Montana State University wearing uh, Organic Marketing Association t-shirts, you know, with the, the hemp labels on them. And that was really fun. They really appreciated that. And uh, we've used them a couple of times to help promote, you know, some of the things that, uh, that, that are going on in organics across Montana. But, um, yeah. Yeah. We're trying to lead the way. We're definitely in, in a leadership role here in the state and we have a good supportive state agency that is, I think makes a big difference compared to what I hear in other states. But uh, so we're, I don't know, we're ahead of the ball game. We're definitely uh, pushing hard to kind of grow that industry, you know, well beyond the, the 1% of the farm gate. Um, and I think this is, this year is going to be a big, huge transitional year for organics. Nice. Yeah. It sounds like, um, both you and Montana have a bright future of, uh, just a gazillion different things going on for you. So I'm excited to see where all that comes from. And now I'm really interested in going and finding some, uh, Montana steaks and wheat and, <laughs> and hemp and a bunch of other things. So yeah, I do, I do the, uh, like Timeless Seeds, there's a company called Timeless Seeds, another great story of the farms that kind of took a chance on lentils and organic lentils. And gosh, you know, nobody really knew what was going on. It's called the, his underground, you know, his, his uh, Timeless Seed underground, the, the lentil underground. This the whole story is written in a book. And um, yeah, some really fascinating stories on farms across the state. Uh, animal agriculture, too. I mean, we've got some in goats and others that are um, just doing a whole variety of things. So I think the cow side of this is really amazing. And the beef is just, I'm sorry for the vegetarians that are listening, I guess, but the, uh, you know, shoot, the beef is just so fantastic. And after traveling in different parts of the world, you can't find good beef. And you come back to Montana and you're like, wow, this is the real deal here. Yeah. And now being able to, you know, add hemp to it, it's only going to make it sweeter. And, you know, nice. Love it. Yeah, but Love lots it. of fun and beautiful place. You know, obviously mountains and lakes and rivers and all the clean water and all those things that we have to work on to protect, especially as you get an influx of more people coming to the state. And and I think a lot of the Western states are like that too. We've seen the Californication movements out of California and coming into flooding into Colorado and Idaho and all across Montana now too. So, and um yeah, as we get into like high speed internet out in the prairie, which we haven't had mm. before, a little bit here and there, you know, it's body, but 5G putting it up in the satellites is going to be, it's a complete game changer in terms of what is possible now from a standpoint of business and where you can do that business. So I hope that as we see people come in, they don't transition out of agriculture. They don't take right. land out of production because it's, it's devastating to the local schools and families and others that work in the industry so yeah that's the key thing you know you're welcome to come here just keep keep uh keep the farm going yeah that is one of the downsides of uh booming states because i'm originally from colorado so i know all too well of uh growing up all the 
uh, patches of land that were once farms. Uh, every time I go back, I feel like there's yet yeah. another chunk of farm or prairie or something like that that's converted to a, a new neighborhood, a new housing neighborhood or something. So, I know. I mean, some of my favorite farms, there's a farm over in, uh, in Bismarck, North Dakota, that's just a beautiful uh, uh, re um, regenerative organic farm, fantastic. And, and Bismarck, which you would think they can go in any direction they want. No, they want... They want to go east and so bismarck is just mowing down coming right at his farm and it's not going to be long but it's sad because just you go just over the hill and you see just a whole sprawl of new roads and new subdivisions coming out of even out in the middle of the prairie you know in here in montana we're in the western part of the state you know like missoula montana it's it's stuck you know it's there's five valleys that come together there's only limited land in the bottom. You can see how it's a serious challenge, you know, to keep some farmland open there. Uh, but out in North Dakota, you know, yeah, it's still a challenge out there too. Well, it sounds like Montana is poised to help uh, start the, what is it, American organic veteran grown <laughs> hemp and other kind of goods industry and really bring back kind of the idea of American made and American grown tied together. Oh, I yeah, I'd love nothing more than to see us start, you know, new spinning technology and, and have, be making ropes and making and spinning yarns and, you know, add, and then adding weaving into this whole thing. And, uh, yeah, there's no reason we can't get more and more involved because you, you think back about our tribal nations. We have tribal nations all across the United States and, and they were making fabrics and, and bringing together these, these fibers together. I mean, we've been messing with hemp. In America, I think since like 1795, when it first came to Kentucky, and so you know we've it's been around. It's just a matter of kind of finding some of the old recipes and finding some of the ways that we can actually integrate. Yeah, so. I feel like that's kind of the same way with organic. It's you know like you said, we we started organic and we'll end organic. It's you know a lot of the things that this industry is moving toward are things that we used to do. We just need to relearn <laughs> how we were doing it in the past and relearn. Yeah. And, through that process, and it's, it's, some of them have been very painful, obviously, as we learned, you know, that Roundup kills everything and all the microbes, and it's really, really bad, and it causes cancer and does all those things, but yet it's still for sale when you go into a Home Depot. I don't fully understand how that's possible, but hopefully we're going and learning more and more about how to get away from those, those harmful chemicals. Yeah. And there are some good. I mean, there's a tiny amount of good. I think in the pesticide list, I saw the report that came out last week. Of all the American pesticides that are approved, only 1% were actually beneficial beneficial to the soil. Only 1%. Wow. 80% were, de uh, whatever, it caused degradation to the soil. And that's that's not good, you know, just trying to control pests. Yeah. And um, It's like short-term gain at a long-term cost. And every time we try to cheat the system, we end up learning that same lesson. Yeah, we do. And a lot of times we just shift it to other countries and let them grow it or let them mine it, and that's wrong too. Yeah. So especially when we have such advanced technologies here in America that we can now apply that, we can mine safely, we can mine without degrading the environment, we can use it all, we can mine it like it's a buffalo basically, you know, like the Indians slaughtered a buffalo. We didn't, you know, just kill the buffalo and take the tongue. You can take the whole animal and use it all if you're gonna use it. And same with the field, you know, the, the hemp plant's a great example because it's got uses all the way from the roots to nice. the shoots. Yeah. That's wonderful. Well, I appreciate all the work you're doing to help uh, the Montana industry continue to grow amazing things and to push the organic industry forward and, and help bring hemp to the world. Uh, I could keep going on. You're doing so many different things. So yeah. I just appreciate all, all that you're doing and yeah. thanks for taking some time to come out and share the story with uh, the Evolve CPG community. Hey, yeah, thanks. I appreciate the chance. I'm speaking on behalf of a whole lot of other really talented people that are all pushing behind the scenes here, too. So to all of them, thank you. And uh, yeah, I appreciate the time. Yeah, cheers. Thanks, KG. Thanks for listening. If you'd like to learn more about John or his company, go to woolenhemp.com. Subscribe to our podcast and YouTube channel for more innovator interviews, expert advice, and leadership discussions. If you like this episode, leave a heart, thumbs up, or review, and share it with your colleagues. As an ever-evolving show, we also love feedback, so send us ideas for who we should talk to next to evolve at modernspecies.com 
And learn about our online community and new masterclass on scaling brand impact at evolvecpg.com. See you next week.